Good morning and welcome to Greywood. We are so excited that you are here with us this morning and I'm excited to invite you to our family ministry auction next Sunday. It starts at five o'clock and it's the best time that you'll ever have. Um, bring your friends, bring your family. We have a game show that's happening throughout the night. We have live auction items, silent auction items. The raffle tickets will be drawn that night. And in my personal opinion, we have the best barbecue that's going to be there that night. We would love for you to join us, invite your friends, invite your family. It's a great time to connect with other families here on our campus. It's really just a good time. We can't wait for you to join us next Sunday, 5 o'clock. Speaking of things that your money goes to, I am happy to share with you um, a huge victory uh, that's happening on our campus through our pillow ministry. You may not know we have a pillow ministry here on campus. They make pillows. They deliver them to local hospitals, hospice, dialysis units. And that ministry is such a blessing to families who are in tough situations. Last year alone, our ministry distributed over 2,360 pillows to local medical units. I wanted to share with you a, just a brief personal story. I recently heard a story of a lady. She and her husband had moved away. They lived in a different state. They were going through some really tough medical times and they were in the hospital. Um, she received a pillow that had Greywood's name on it. I don't know how our pillows made it to another state, but she said that seeing her church from her hometown where they were at was such a bright spot to her day. And she was just so relieved and excited to receive that. So your faithful contributions, your weekly givings and tithes go to ministries like our pillow ministry who are touching families' lives when they are in really difficult situations. So thank you for constantly trusting us, us with your finances uh, because with those things, we're allowed to bless the community and families through that. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. Please stand up and worship with us. Good morning, y'all. Let's stand together. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. If failure won't define me, that's what my father does. Lift that up. If failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never want it perfect, you just want it my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the Father's in. Come on! Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Money changes everything. And prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles! Miracles take place, the cynical find faith, 
Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Dreams and walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore ooh you're in the Father's house ooh lay your burdens down ooh here in the Father's house check your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Oh, you're in the Father's house. Come on, give him praise. Who I am, because I know who you are. Cross of salvation was only the star. Now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future, and it's worth the living. Cause I was made to be tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more So why would I make a bed in my shame When a fountain of grace Running my way, I know I am yours. I was made for more. Who I am, cause I know who you are. The cross of salvation was only the star. Now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future, and it's worth the living. Cause I was made to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and Hallelujah. Cause I was made for more. How would I make a bed in my 
shame when I found in the grace is running my way. I know I am yours. I was made for more. I wasn't made. I was made to be tinted in a grave. I was born like born and raised like to life again. swallow truth. May we swallow the truth of your goodness, the truth of what you've done, the truth of what you're doing. And Father, a part of that, can we just breathe in deep the truth that you overcome all things, even our darkness, where our sin is great, your grace is infinitely greater. Where the world is broken, your healing power is infinitely greater. Lord, we praise you. So can we just sit in the truth for a second? Holy Spirit, would you just speak sweet truth to us now? We praise you, Lord.
truth this morning, Graywood. Jesus changes everything. Amen. Lord, you're so worthy. Lord, you're so good. We praise you alone today. Who else is worth all of this fanfare? Because we're not just your fans, we're your children. Who else is worth such praise? None. You're the only one. You're the holy of holies. You're the worthy one. You're the only name that has power. You're the foundation that cannot be shaken. You're the all-consuming fire. You're the one who's worthy of all of our affection, all of our attention. You're the one who sits upon the highest throne. You're the one who speaks life into existence. Fill our mouth with your praise. May our actions follow suit. so worthy and may our life show it. Give us courage to follow your direction today. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, I may be seated. So, as a father, I made a terrible mistake yesterday. Um, we were driving down the road, and I mentioned that uh, about war. And I said that, you know, Iran was kind of moving into position to attack Israel, and, and the Soviets were moving in, and I hear Emma from the back seat because Christy puts me in the middle seats because she apparently doesn't like to drive in the middle seats because she gets sick. So I'm close to my daughter, um, and, and Emma says, what does that mean? I said, well, it could mean war. And then there was a pause. And she said, Dad, or she said, Daddy, will they come get us? And I said, uh, well, I'm pretty sure not. And she's like, I'm, I'm kind of scared. I said, it's going to be okay, baby, I promise. It's going to be fine. And then a few minutes later... Uh, she said, are you sure that they're not going to come get us? And Riley from the driver's side said, Emma, shut up. Nobody's looking, nobody's coming to this country looking for Emma Wilcutt, okay? 
Um, but we got home, and she continued to ask questions and, and things like that. And, and if, you're, if you're existing in this world today, um, we know that it's a very chaotic time. Uh, and we, we sing songs about uh, us having faith in Him and us growing in Him and us being a, a part of something bigger. Um, I think now more than ever, there is a time for the church um, to be the representation of Christ that we possibly, as much as we possibly can be. And I think sometimes uh, we've got this view of, of what it's supposed to look like, but time after time, if you read Scripture, Scripture gives us a complete picture of what it means to not only be used by Christ, but in order for us to be used by Christ, Christ wants to grow us. In other words, and I've said this from the pulpit before, if you've been saved longer than 10 years, and I'm, not, I'm just picking that number randomly, if you've been saved longer than 10 years, and you see yourself as not growing, there's a problem there, right? Um, I mean, there isn't a single parent in this room that if their child just instantaneously stopped growing, that we wouldn't instantaneously make an appointment with the pediatrician or whatever going, okay, why isn't my child growing over, you know, three foot. And so in the same fashion, in our spiritual life, if, if we hit a snag, and we're always going to hit snags along the way, when we hit this snag and we just stop growing, there is something detrimental to your spiritual life. And again, we all go through these ups and downs in life, and I, I don't want to make that perfectly understandable, that every single one of us in this room, if you are a believer and follower of Jesus, there is always going to be the ebb and the flow in your Christian walk, okay? But with that ebb and that flow, there's always going to be growth that is produced in that. And if there's not, I want to challenge you this morning just to step out on faith and just acknowledge it. Because you know, if you've ever been to an AA meeting, it says the first step to recovery is admitting you have a what? Problem. See, half of you have been in AA. That's good. <laughs> That's good. So I'm talking to a bunch of former alcoholics. <laughs> That's good. All right. Even the church members, listen, this is how you know you're Baptist when you're closet drinkers, okay? Um, oh, didn't expect everybody to say problem. Jeez. So next week, we'll be starting a new program called Celebrate Recovery for those of you in this room <laughs> that spoke up. Um, now, the growth in your faith, when we, when we see things like we see that's going on in the Middle East and all of that, uh, for, the, for the lost and dying world, that, that creates panic. But for the believer who is secure in their faith and is growing and is flourishing, we know that there, is gonna be, there are going to be wars, Right? Anytime you put human beings on the face of the planet, pride kicks in, um, and, and all of a sudden we want more power. And that's, that's, that's inclusive of, of our leadership in our country and other leaderships in other countries. We demand power, we demand respect, and that is the outcry of the human life. And then this, this God-man comes to the earth and says, listen, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, be the least. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven serve. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, don't lord it over people. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, whatever you value is considered nothing in comparison to knowing this Jesus. It went against everything in the Roman Empire, the teachings of the Roman Empire. It went against everything uh, that Judaism went against. It went against everything that the culture goes against for Jesus to look at us and go, listen, if you want to be successful, be nothing. If you want to be successful, give up everything, come and follow me. And then over the years, we've justified that. And we go, well, we're following him, but we don't follow him at a distance. Right? You know, there were people in Scripture that did that as well. There were the apostles that followed him, followed him. And then there were people that were, hey, listen, we're, we're over here and we're, we're following you. You okay? Okay, we'll take a couple of steps closer. I want you to understand something. The growth of your, your faith is incredibly important because it moves you 
from this idea of the fringe. And what I mean by fringe is, you know, you're teetering on the line of the world and you're teetering on the line of your faith and you're trying to figure it out. Uh, there are people in this room that are fringe people. And, and you don't even know that you're fringe people. Now, let me give you a definition of the fringe. The fringe is, I really don't know if I want to commit fully to this Jesus. And where you are is where every single one of us that are born-again believers in this room, that's where we vent. We haven't really wanted to follow Jesus real close because we're afraid of what it'll get us into, what it'll cost us. And so this idea of fringe people is we're not, we're not sure. Do I follow Jesus? Do I not follow Jesus? Uh, and we see that. And I respect that because at some point, to some degree, I was a fringe individual. I'll just come to church at 11 a.m. and that's it. That's what I told Christy. I'm good. And the more that I started to grow in my faith, the more that God moved me from the fringe to a more committed relationship with not only Him, but with other people. And so I want to talk about today the growth of your faith. Because Cody talked a little bit last week about uh, you know, David saying, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And Cody elaborated on that, that the presence of your enemy is, is kind of the spiritual warfare. Every single one of us, whether you're saved in this room or you're not, you are in spiritual warfare and you just don't know it. And there is a great fight for your soul. And so the truth is to grow in your faith, and, and listen, I, I'm, I'm going to say something that may offend some of you in this room. The growth of your faith is not indicative of the age that you are. I do not care how many years you've spent in the local church, your faith can still be just as stagnant as maybe a youth. You might not like to admit that, and that's fine, you don't have to admit that. But that's the reality of it. The growth of your faith is an intimate aspect between you and God. And God wants you, believe it or not, God wants you without sounding like a particular preacher who's in Houston that has a multi-million dollar. <laughs> God wants you living your best life on earth but not as good as it would be in heaven, okay? And his definition of the best life here on earth is health, wealth, and money, and popularity, and success. And God's definition of success on earth is the speaking of the gospel, the discipleship of many people, the investment of your time and your energy in people. Because... Ultimately, money will be spent, popularity will fade, your name will disappear, but the things that you invest in will carry on for generations. Second Peter, chapter 1. In typical Baptist fashion, I'm going to give you three things. Second Peter, chapter 1. I, I, love, I love reading... These two books that are written by Simon Peter because you see a different Simon Peter in these particular books than you do the one following Jesus. He's probably matured. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's grown in his faith a lot. Um, and so we see this Simon Peter and he's, he's telling his listeners about the growth of their faith and where it flows from. And I want you to understand, this is a side note. If you think that the more that you, you do, the more that you grow, that's a fallacy. Because ultimately, I know that as a believer, I know that everything that I have received, and I use that term very seriously, everything that I've received has flowed from the Father. I am where I am right now because of the faithfulness of God. Because of his love for me and his devotion to me, even though I wasn't very devoted to him. So listen to what Peter says. He says this, his divine power, starting in verse 3, his divine power has given us everything required for life. And godliness, 
through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. So the very first thing that I see in this passage of Scripture is this. Number one is this. His power and provision gives us what we need to grow. So I thought about bringing Vera back out here and placing her on the... You don't know who Vera is. Vera is my aloe vera plant that sits in my, um, my office in the windowsill that I water, I talk to. Call me insane, whatever. She doesn't talk back. When she talks back, then we're going to have issues, church. Um, but in the same sense, I want you to understand something. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. In other words, He has provided everything He's provided the right environment for us. He's provided the right soil for us. He has placed us right where we need to be for such a time as this. And he even, at some point, allows hardships and difficult moments to come about so that we begin to understand that it's no longer about us. How many of you have had hardships in this life? For those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're lucky. Not lucky, I don't believe in luck. His power is like him planting us in the right soil. His power and his, his ability has given us what we need to grow. In other words, you were planted in a church for such a time as this. You were challenged by the people around you. You were challenged by the ministerial staff. You were challenged by a lot of different things. You are challenged by circumstances. All of those particular things produce growth. So I want to put a different spin on it. Every hardship that you endure, whether you deem it as fair or unfair, is a byproduct of just life, right? We know that in life there are hardships. We know that there are difficult moments. There are difficult moments within our family. Uh, when our children grow up, they do things that maybe we don't want them to do, but they do them anyway because we're all idiots in some way or form. They don't live the life that we really wanted them to live. They, we want them to experience the roses and all of these different things, but they show up sometimes and they're bloody because of the thorns. And as parents, I can look at you, as a parent, I can look at you and say, man, I really didn't want this to happen to you. This is not the way that I had this planned out in my life. But I understand that those thorns make you the individual that you are. His power and provision gives us what we need to grow. In other words, what I've learned over the last few years, that even in the deepest and the darkest hardships of my life, he has never left me, nor has he given up on me. Even in those moments where I feel like, Maybe he did abandon me. And I know that you're sitting there thinking, well, the preacher says that God abandoned you. No, I didn't say that. I'm saying this. I'm saying even in the moments where it feels like he is not there, he is there. Just because you don't feel him, and I, I think that that's half the problem, is we base a lot of our Christian walk, if I'm just being completely honest with you, we base a lot of our Christian walk on on feelings. How, how do I feel? Do I feel close to God? Or do I feel far away from God? Do I feel the presence of God? Or do I not feel the presence of God? And it's, listen, as I got to be honest, like that's a part of our human nature. God gave us emotions. He gave us all these different things. So I'm not saying that all of those things are wrong, but your response sometimes ultimately will produce growth. In other words, if I believe the truth that God is with me no matter what, then my response when I don't necessarily feel Him is to not only confess that, but to lean in and press in more to my study and to my prayer life. God, I know that you're here. I know that you're present. I know that you're right here walking with me through all of this. Let me just lean into you, God. I don't know what it is. There's a lot of distractions in my life. There's all sorts of things. But I know this, that I crave you more than I crave my next breath. I crave you more than I crave that next 
drink of water or that next little bit of food. God, I crave, because here's the thing. When, what I've understood is this. There are moments, like when you go to youth camp, and, and for those of you that have never been to youth camp, man, it is awesome. The sleeplessness, eh, I could give up. But we're talking about a week of listening to the Word of God preached, building relationships, and worship. Like I've had people say, well, listen, when you come back from camp, you're, you're lit, like you're, you're on fire. Yes, because I have spent a solid week doing nothing but worshiping, praying, listening to preaching, and eventually getting two to three hours of sleep a night. What I've grown to understand is this truth. The reason we have a tendency to not grow is because there's sometimes when we, we step out of that realm, we stop allowing God to water us. But His power is still His power, and His provision is still His provision. Does that make sense? And Peter, the Apostle Peter says, listen, his divine power has given us everything. That, that word given us is a, a past participle, which basically means this. It happened in the past, and it has repercussions through the ages. In other words, he has given you everything that you need for the growth of your life. He has already sowed it into your life. Secondly, his promises, promises gives us room to grow. Can I just be honest with you? I, I know this role of pastor comes with a lot of uh, preconceived notions. It comes with a lot of thought of, of man, he's got it together. He, listen, if you're sitting in this audience, this is your first time here, understand this truth. I do not have it all together. There are moments in my life where I think, oh, man, I'm going really, really good. I, it's, it's going great. It's awesome, wonderful, stupendous, marvelous. And then the very next thing, I feel like I just want to claw my skin off and just go to heaven because I'm tired of the flesh. I'm tired of the flesh interfering with my growth process. But here's the beautiful thing. His promises gives us room to grow. He knows that we're going to make mistakes. Now, I don't willfully just try to like, actively pursue my sin. I've reached past that stage. Like I, I know, I know, because Jesus rescued me from this, that I'm not to lean back into drugs, pornography, things outside of the marriage. I know that I'm not supposed to do that, and so I don't lean into those things. But I was laying there the other night, and it was one of those moments where I really thought that I had it, I was, I was going good. And I laid my head down, I crawled into bed, it's like 8.30, Chrissy's asleep, she's got her earplugs in. And so I just, I'm praying. I'm like, God, it was, a, it was an amazing day. I feel like I really just, and I, this is what I said, I really feel like I killed it today. It's one of those spiritual moments where you just look at it and go, man, I... <laughs> I mean, I visited people, I prayed with people, I, I, I had a pretty good quiet time. I, like, it was, it was good, man, I, I, am, I am good. It's a good day. And then I made the mistake, and it's not really a mistake, I'm joking, but I made the mistake of, God, is there anything in my life that needs to be confessed or purged before I lay my head down tonight? Would you, I mean, before I fall asleep, would you please reveal that stuff to me? And there were things start popping into my head that I was like, maybe it wasn't such a good day. <laughs> to the point that I had just gotten hard on myself, like, dang, I'm messed up. I'm not as good as I thought I was. <laughs> Which in turn to led, led to this idea of I failed. And I know that that's how a lot of you feel in this room. Even though you might not confess it, you feel like I laid that bag down, but I find myself picking that bag back up and walking with it. 
whatever that bag is. His promises gives us room to grow. In other words, it says, by these, he has given us very great and precious promises. So that through them, you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. God knows that within my soul, there are evil desires. There's not, I'm not wanting them to be, they're just there. And God also knows that any given moment, there are thoughts that pop into my head that are not godly. There are things that I may say in my mind, even though I do not say it to anyone, that I will be held accountable for. Am I proud of those things? Absolutely not. But I do not want you to walk out of this door thinking that I have it all together, because I don't. So I am going to mess up your image of me, because I never want to portray something that I am not. And I, the last thing that I want is someone to come in and sit on the back row. Not that I'm picking on you that sits in the back row. I'm not. But the last thing that I want is for someone to walk in and sit on the back row and think to themselves, just for a second, I will never be as good as he is. Because that's simply not true. But the beautiful thing that I have understood about the living God is he gives me room to grow. That even in my weaknesses... God's power is perfected, and, and there's this passage of Scripture that I've always clung to in, in Romans chapter 7 that it says this, man, the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. And the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. And then Paul, in this instant, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will set me free? And in this moment lies one of the greatest statements. If you want to mark that down, Romans chapter 7. And I've read this to you before. Starting in verse 24 of chapter 7, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this dying body? I thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ, so then with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law, of God, but with my flesh to the law of sin. Therefore, this is in chapter 8, there is now no condemnation exists for those in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Let me explain this to you from a parental standpoint. There are going to be consequences to my children's actions. There will always be. You touch a hot skillet, you're going to get burned. You lick a light socket, you're going to get electrocuted. There are consequences to your actions every single day. You do something stupid, the, uh, the, the repercussions of that you will bear on your body or in your soul or wherever. But that does not negate the freedom and that does not negate the forgiving, forgiveness power of the Lord Jesus Christ in you. Now, he wants you to recognize it, and he wants you to move forward in it and move past it. And he doesn't want you to dwell in it, but he wants you to recognize it as non-beneficial. Because if you begin to recognize it as non-beneficial, not beneficial for your spiritual walk... The desire of his heart is for you to release it. Because ultimately, what he's wanting for your life is a deeper walk with you. <laughs> he wants a deeper walk with you. Again, we, we, we look at God sometimes as this big, unapproachable God that we don't want to have anything to do with. You just stay over there and I'll stay over here and... No, the intimacy of God is He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to grow deeper in knowing who He is so that you see value in that relationship. To grow in that relationship means that you're learning more about who He is because He already knows you. And the more that you know about Him and the more that you grow in Him, the more you want to stay near him. 
And it's almost as if it's returning to the Garden of Eden because of what Christ did on the cross. It is almost a returning to the Garden of Eden where God walks in the cool of the day with Adam. And you heard Cody say that last week. He's still sitting in the same spot, waiting on you. And when you do make mistakes, and you will, his promises gives us room to grow. I'm still waiting here. Now, the last thing that I want, and hear my heart for you, the last thing that I want is you to look up 30 years from now and still be in the same spot that you were in 30 years before. That, that goes way deeper than just walking away from God for a period of time. That's, I have completely abandoned if I even knew who God was to begin with. His promises gives us room to grow. He gives you room to grow. Thirdly, His purpose for us is to be beneficial to those around us. Listen to what He says. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sin. In other words, you have the ability to forget that. And Scripture says that you are short-sighted and you might even be blind. And you have forgotten your first love. His purpose for us is to be beneficial to those around us. And I'm not saying that you're saved by works. By no means. You are saved by grace. But your works is an outpouring of what you have received. In other words... When I come to this great understanding that God's grace is deeper than I can even fathom in my own brain. I do everything, or I try to do everything, not always successful. As if I'm doing it for the Lord. Whatever you do. I know some of you, you don't like cleaning toilets. And when you have to clean a toilet, you grumble. I do. I hate, listen, I hate folding clothes because I don't know how. My idea, even after me and Christy got married, my idea of pressing clothes and folding clothes is to lay them on the carpet and walk across them enough times that they're pressed. Nothing's changed. If it had not been, if it's not for her grace and it's not for her folding of the clothes, my clothes would be wrinkle-free and they would be on the floor. She's aware of that. She knows after almost 21 years that that's the way that it functions. And so she is constantly folding clothes. I hate folding clothes. But I am aware that when I do, and if I do have to fold clothes, which now we got kids so they can do it. But I am aware that if there is ever a day that I have to fold clothes... And she's going to hold me to this because I promise you she remembers everything. That I cannot do it without grumbling. Right? It's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen. (laughs) It's supposed to be your works, your purpose is supposed to be for the benefit of those around you. You're not working for yourself. You're working for those around you. Why? Because you see the value in human life. And for the first time, maybe in your life, you see what God sees. That there is ultimately value in human life. And I'm an, I, I, listen, I'm an optimist when it comes to this. I am an optimist and I believe that there is value in every human being's life. Now, you might reject that thought, and that's fine. There has never been a time in the history of humanity that God, who is the creator and sustainer of all life, messes up. I saw something one time that said God doesn't make junk. 
God's MO has not changed. So if I know that God's MO has not changed, then there is value in human life. Everyone in this room has value. Now, you might not see it as that, but the reality is as you add value to the world. And God wants to give you the purpose that you were created for so that you can just enjoy that. And when all the bombs are going off around you and all the wars and rumors of wars and all of that stuff, I am confident of this, that he still has me a purpose. That right now there are people in Israel that are receiving the gospel message through war. Right now, there are homeless people that are receiving the gospel message through many organizations. Right now, there are people, your neighbors, are receiving the gospel message through how you respond to them. You are beneficial to the kingdom of heaven. You're not perfect. You're messed up. But the beautiful thing is, and this is what I've learned in 20 plus years of my salvation. God really does, and I've used this term before because I love this. This is a description of me. God does truly use crooked sticks to make straight lines. But he wants you to pursue him. And here's the thing, and this is just a side note. When you get up tomorrow and you're ready to go and you're ready to spend time with Jesus and there's distractions, please understand what those distractions are. And if you get up tomorrow morning and you fail at having a quiet time or spending time with Jesus, there's always midday. There's always the nighttime. There's always and forever has been 24 hours in a day for you to spend just moments with God. And so this is my challenge to you. When you get up tomorrow morning or whenever time you choose, with no distractions, I want you to sit in a chair. I don't care if it's in the middle of your living room. doesn't matter. Men, if it's the bathroom, instead of watching TikTok and Facebook, and all sorts of things like you typically do, as I'm not stupid. Spend time with God. You're like, that's gross. Eh, well, that's the reality. <laughs> Spend time with Him. You may just come to understand that God, in His infinite love for us, just wants to hang out with you and wants to prepare your day. To do his will, his work, for his glory. When you turn on the news and you see the wars and the rumors of wars, don't be rattled by that. Your God is still in control. And what's the worst thing that can happen? They come to my house and search for Emma Wilcutt. No. The worst case scenario is we get a chance to minister to people somewhere. And I think that that's what made the apostles the apostles, that even when they went to prison, they viewed it as a positive thing. Because they viewed it as an opportunity to share the gospel. No matter the circumstance that they were in. And Paul writes about that. He says, while I'm in chains... I write to you. The Apostle Peter did the same thing. So regardless of your circumstances, regardless of gas prices, <laughs> regardless of a lot of things, your God is still in control. And he just wants to sit with you for a while. Let me pray for you. While you're sitting here, I just want to ask you a question with your eyes closed. Is Jesus the Lord and the Savior of your life?
I truly believe you can't have one without the other. And I want you to sincerely ask yourself that question. If the answer to that question is, I don't know, or no, then I want you to know this. If there are individuals in the back, Jared's in the back, Keith will be in the back, there will be counselors in the back that will be able to show you what it means to walk with Christ in a relationship. Or maybe God has brought you here and God is like, man, this is where I want you to be. You're, you're saved, you've been baptized, whatever. And this is where God wants you to be. This is his church for you. If that's a description of you, then over the next few minutes after I cro- close in prayer, I would invite you to get up from where you are and make your way to the back as well. Or maybe you can just look at yourself and you go, Chris, I'm saved I'm a member of the church, but I'm really not growing. Listen, these altars are open for you to just confess that before God. Or you can just sit in your seat and confess that. And then after this service is over, would you just make your way up to me and say, Chris, I need some ideas on how to grow. Because listen, if there is anybody that wants you to grow in your faith, it's me. I want you to grow. Father, we love you, and we give you this moment, and we pray that you are honored above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond. The highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair fell down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child now reconciled and pardoned. shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and Strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forever. saints and angels song could we with thee the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made where every star on earth a quill and every Ascribed by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song oh love of god how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore
Amen. You can be seated for just a second. Jennifer, come on up here. Because we're going to introduce you to a, another ministry that Graywood is involved in. So I have notes. you have notes. <laughs> yeah, I have notes. Okay, fair enough. I wanted to be prepared. Okay. So what is your name? Jennifer Williams. And what is it that you are doing? Well, um, I am a member of our class 242. Thank you. I have a chant? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so our class launched back in uh, last April, so we've been at class for a year. Um, it's based on Acts 242. I'm telling you, I'm prepared. Um, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And um, so we have... <laughs> Four pillars. <laughs> we have four pillars that we stand for um, that we actually got from SWAG, which is prayer, discipleship, fellowship, and service, um, which is based on Acts 2.42. We are a very um, different kind of class. We enjoy being together. We enjoy fellowship. We got together last night, but we also, um, we believe in service. Okay. So... So what ministry do you do? Um, so we have partnered with um, 318 Church. We started, um, we, we started with them back in August. 318 Church meets uh, downtown. They minister to the homeless population. So they have a service on Saturday nights at 5 o'clock at the Lovewell Center. And they, they minister. They have a, like a full church service. And then afterwards, they like to give the members a meal. So what we have done is we have um, committed to, for the next year, to every fourth Saturday, we go and we serve a meal to the, the members there. So we bring enough food for 100 plates. We have done sloppy joes, chicken, um, chicken spaghetti. We're doing pastalaya in two weeks. We got that, um, our, our, our member, um, Judge Nicholas Gasper, he's leading that one up for us. Um, but... We get to, um, we go there early, we set up, and then we get to sit in, in the worship service with the members, which has been really empower, uh, powerful to get to sit there and worship with people who maybe aren't like most people, but it's been really sweet. I mean, to get there and sing goodness of God with people who are living in shelters or worse, um, we've gotten to encourage the leadership team that's there, um, and I feel like it's very it works with what you've talked about. Like, it's not look at us like tooting our own horn, but like God's been so good and kind to us, and so we get to love on other people. Right. So how can they get involved? Well, <laughs> 100 meals, um, and we're very careful about how we spend our money, but it costs us about between three and $400 a month to go down there and serve because we have to bring everything. We do the meal, but it's also the package. It's cutlery, water, um, any drinks that we do, desserts, um, and so we've done, we're doing some creative things. Every month we have, um, if you've noticed out in the Welcome Center, we have some sort of topic that you can vote on. Like in December it was, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes, it is. That was the, the answer. Yes, it is. Um, right now, right now the, the, the question is, is Johnny's Pizza the best pizza in no. town? See, that's why you should go vote. No. So um, you can do that. Um, we also take Venmo. Um, we take Cash App. Um, but we're also looking for ways that you, if you would like to just come serve with us. So we've had some classes who said, well, we can't go down there and serve, but we'll help you cook. So we're here every fourth Saturday cooking. Um, if your class wants to partner with us, we've had a class who just, they took January. They said, we're all in. And so they, they did everything, which worked out because that was a month that we were kind of struggling. Um, and so if your small group is interested in serving with us, see me or Ashley or Adam Trailer or anybody that's in 242. You know, the people that did the chant a while ago, those are the people that you need to see. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much. And, and, and here's the thing. I want to add to this really quickly. You know, God commands us constantly to be cheerful givers. Like, everything that we have, whether it's outside of our wallet or inside of our wallet, 
it's all God's to begin with. So everything that he's blessed you with, he has blessed you with for a reason. And so I've always told you, and the staff has always told you, that we believe in honoring God with our time, with our treasure, and with our talents. And that's, that's part of the thing that when every single month when we, when we usher in a new ministry that we do, I want to encourage you guys that if you're not involved in some sort of ministry, to be plugged in and get yourself involved in some of these ministries. Because I promise you right now, when you're, when you're hanging out with some of these people that they're talking about at, at 318 and other places like that, um, it's a unique opportunity just to see a different perspective. Because um, sometimes we have a tendency to live in a bubble. Um, and so my encouragement to you is, is, you know, come and help. Be a part of something. Okay? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I was going to move your notes. <laughs> Let me pray for you guys. Jesus, I love you. I thank you so much for our time together. Uh, God, thank you so much that you have loved us and you give us room to grow. Thank you so much that you're not uh, a God that pushes, it in, pushes us into outer darkness, uh, God, for our mistakes, but that you are constantly moving towards us. You're constantly motivating us to be better each and every day. So, Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us because of Christ. We thank you for the freedom that we have uh, to grow and to learn and to serve. And Father, I do pray for uh, this ministry that, that 242 is involved in. Father, I pray that we have the ability to minister to people outside of our bubble, outside of the typical norm. God, help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus and help us to do it with a loving heart, Father, always. We love you, we trust you, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. I love you guys.